Welcome to ATC MD Emergency Medicine channel. Uh, today we'll be discussing about an elderly female who was brought to here with complaints of altered sensory. So a 61 year old female was brought to here with complaints of altered sensory since past six days. Associated with uh, complaints of general... What are things when an elderly lady come to ER? Before starting the actual case discussion, what are things you will be make you will make sure? Uh, levels, like that. It is medicine. Hmm. Other than medicine. Elderly individual. Trauma pit and trauma. Yeah. The way she was brought to hospital, like it was ambulatory or hmm. so was brought in a store. You have to always check uh, for any abuse, uh, like signs of abuse. Elder abuse is hmm. very, very common in our country. So we have to be very careful when we are examining the patient. Look for signs of any abuse or any trauma, external injury. External injury. All these things are very important. Hmm. Medicine is different that we have to take care for this part we have to be very careful hmm. so the 61 year old female was brought to here with complaints of altered sensory since past six days and she was admitted outside the hospital and along with that she had complaints of generalized body pain but at lower limb pain and <coughs> what are the reasons for a generalized body pain in an elderly individual osteoporosis. osteoporosis osteoporosis that is the most important thing why we are worried about osteoporosis in emergency room Pathological Pathological fracture. Fracture. So, while handling the patient, if you are not careful, that itself will produce Pathological. fractures. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we should be very careful. Mm -hmm. Osteoporotic lesions, anytime it can uh, develop fractures. Mm -hmm. So, in my initial 10 seconds, when the patient was obtained and not obtained to my comments. I went to the primary survey. Uh, her airway was patent. There was no signs of any airway obstruction. Mm -hmm. There was no strider. There was no gurgling or pooling or secretions. A breathing part, as she had a clear chest with bilateral equal entry with no added sounds. Uh, adequate chest discussions were there and respiratory rate was 18 per minute and SPO2 she maintained 97% in room air. Circulatory part, uh, her heart rate was 117 per minute and blood pressure and water was 160 by 100. Uh, disability part, uh, she was conscious but uh, disoriented in between restless and not obeying to commands. 117 heart rate, mm -hmm. what are the reasons for tachycardia and under the individual? Uh, one thing could be fever. Okay, fever. Uh, any pain. Pain. Pain is the most important thing in elderly individuals. Because fever, we are examining, we are not able to find any fever. But pain, they may not be able to tell you. That may be the reason for delirium, that may be the reason for tachycardia. Everything, that is the reason. So, we should be very careful in examining <coughs> the case. Uh, so, she was in between restless and not obeying to commands. And she may respond to only painful stimuli. GCS recorder was E2, V2 and M4. Pupils are equally reactive to amount of bilaterally reactive. Uh, her temperature recorder was normal. And primary adjuncts, we checked her GLBS, it was 147 million. Can an elderly individual can have fever, sorry, infection <coughs> without fever? Mm, yes. So that's also possible. Mm. Uh, so primary adjuncts, uh, GLBS check was 147 milliliter per deciliter. And ECG taken was showing normal chance to. Uh, considering his condition, we also checked for a VBG. It was not showing any acid base derangement. Okay. In our mission, we also have the electrolytes, it was also found to be normal. So, we went to the second, in the primary survey, there wasn't much to do because she was somewhat stable except for her mental condition, like she was a bit altered sensory. So, secondary survey, her symptoms was like uh, six days back, uh, she started developing some altered sensorium along with complaints of myalgia and bilateral overlapping pain, and she was taken to a nearby hospital admitted. Her initial evaluation, uh, she was found for leukocytosis with uh, features of UTA. And she was conservatively managed. But over the uh, day's progress, she her sensory started worsening. And they initially took a CT brain, it was not showing any IC blade. But since the uh, sensory worsened, they by discharged the patient and brought to our hospital for further management. Can urinary tract infection produce altered behavior? Yes, uh, no, Toxic and Any infection mm. can produce a elderly individual. UTA is one of the common cause for altered behavior. Mm. That is because of uh, toxic and uh, so, <coughs> apart from that, she only had intermittent history of fever, but there was no loss of consciousness as such, no history of any seizures or vomiting. There was no history of any headache, any abdominal pain. There was no recent history of any fall, trauma, or any drug overdose. There was no history of any non drug allergies, and she was a known case of mood disorder. But the extra details were not known, but she was taking lithium and some other medications for uh, antipsychotics and mood stabilizers. Yeah. And past medical and surgical history, there was no significant. And the last meal actually she was on right street feeding and that day before coming was the last feed about 4 hours back. 
there was no significant events near uh, recently which contributed to the current event. So clinical examination again, uh, she was restless and in between, uh, in between restless and disoriented. Uh, again, the clinical examination, as we have mentioned before, uh, chest was clear, respiratory system was clear, and cardiovascular GNT was also clear. In the CNS part, uh, she had a GCS of E2, E2, M4, and people were equally reactive. The tone was almost normal in all four limbs, and power was also 5 by 5. And when did you check the power in this patient? Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, for when we giving pain stimulation, she was actually flexing with this thing. That's the only way we could actually assess this patient. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, she was not obeying commands or anything. So, mm -hmm. an elderly individual in an altered behavior, it will be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So only a main response was to pay. You can only see whether both sides are moving equally or not. Mm. Okay, power checking may not be practical. Mm. And deep tender rectuses were exaggerated in all four limbs. And also planters were bilateral extensor. Okay. Uh, that so means what? Bilateral extensor. And that's got some value. Mm. Uh, you cannot tell no value. if. Mm. Uh, Patient is having encephalopathy. It is an involvement of bilateral UMN tract. So, mm. it's a sign of encephalopathy in elderly individual. Mm. Like she told, sometimes it has got no value. If bilaterally is extensor, then it can be a, a deep comatose state. Mm. But here, in this case, it is due to encephalopathy. Mm. So, from an emergency point of view, actually, her primary survey was stable except for the outer sensoria. And since in view of her current condition, we actually admitted the patient in our ICU for further management. It's another thing, yeah. so you have to keep in mind the history of constipation, bowel and maturation. Mm -hmm. See, they are altered when the state has altered sensoria mm -hmm. and if they are not passing, and especially in the elderly people. Mm -hmm. So, in that, they will also be producing them. Mm -hmm. So she was catheterized when she was brought into the hospital, like from hospital. She was brought in with Foley's yeah. from the hospital. Ah. Okay, Bauer and Mutual, you have to mention. Whatever uh, sedation you are giving, mm. it will never touch unless uh, you are emptying the bladder. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. So our patient was admitted in the you know, ICU for further evaluation. So initially, our this blood immunizations came up. It was also showing elevated blood counts, glucocytosis with a count of 17,000 and the CRP was 34 and Procal was 4, uh, 0.6 and then a uh, urine report came to be in numerous percents. Okay. Uh, she was actually on outside treated with injection neuropenem which we initially continued mm -hmm. and then admitted for further evaluation. Mm -hmm. And in our evaluation actually a sensory was still in a community occurred UTA, mm -hmm. what is the need of neuropenem? I am just asking. Is it uh, really required? Or? The muropenem actually was shut in actually uh, same multiple indications in outside hospital because the sensoring was worsening. So they want to like cover for next year's So they want to cover for uh, they want to cover a meningitis. Meningitis also. So in view of that, they shut down muropenem, which we initially continued. And uh, since her uh, sensor was not improving, uh, we initially took an. Uh, suppose you are the treating physician in a case, case who is having urinary tract infection like this. Mm -hmm. What will be your preferred antibiotic? Yeah, initially, we can go for uh, fluid of neuron. Uh, Urin no. Urinary tract infection uh, with nitrofurinone nitro nitro or... Uh, this patient. Fluoroquinone, why we don't prefer? Uh, because of... He is an elderly individual, mm -hmm. already in altered behavior. Fluoroquinone is known to produce altered behavior. Mm -hmm. Quinlone psychosis. So, so we don't prefer And again, it can produce seizures. Mm -hmm. So you can go for a cephalosporins. Cephalosporins or... Augmentin. Augmentin is a safer uh, penicillin. It's a safer option here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, like you told septriaxone, mm. that also acts in the brain. Mm. When we don't know whether brain is involved or not. Mm. So considering her uh, mental status, we took an MRI brain. It was showing uh, sulcal hyperintensities and gyral edema, size of meningoencephalitis. Oh. And so we took an LP study. And oh. CSF analysis was showing a picture of a partially dated meningitis. Mm. And the total counts were 17,000 and DN, uh, DC was 70% 70, 70 mononuclear and 30% secondary cells. Protein was 27 and glucose was 82. Okay. How do you know it is partially treated bacterial meningitis? No, usually bacterial, as uh, in the early phase, the, it will be more of a neutrophil predominant, more than 90% will be neutrophil. It is mononuclear. Uh, mononuclear is predominant. And also the counts will be usually like uh, more than uh, 100 cells per micro. Be Why not it is tuberculosis, uh, TB meningitis, but there also you can get altered behavior. Mm. 
That indicates what? Fibrin web appearance indicates it contains protein, that's all. It can be there in any type of uh, chronic meningitis, including TB, fungus, everywhere you get. So it is it is not in favor of uh, TB meningitis. Suppose you want to rule out TB meningitis, what test you want to ask? So to differentiate that, actually we sent for a uh, cytology evaluation on honey's actually a gene expert. Gene expert. Ah. Okay. What is gene expert? Uh, gene expert is uh, recombinant. Uh, hmm, what uh, what uh, will uh, you get in gene expert? It is a nucleic augmented acid. nucleic acid, nucleic acid. Uh, NAT test, mm. nucleic acid amplification test. Mm. What are things you know in uh, gene expert? Uh, two things. One is actually that is positive and negative. And also, the uh, MDL. Uh, one is that you will know whether TB bacteria is mm. present. Or second one, rifampicin sensitive or not? Yeah, okay, rifampicin mm. sensitive or resistant. Mm. Okay. In a repeat, suppose once it is positive, in a repeat uh, test, will you do it? We uh, don't. We don't do because mm. it it even pick up the dead ba bacilli, mm -hmm. dead bacteria TB. So only to diagnose you have to do, mm -hmm. afterwards, second time when you are doing LP, we should never ask if it is already diagnosed, mm -hmm. okay. It will not tell whether it is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. So only one time you can ask if it is positive. If it is negative, again you can, can ask. Repeat. Okay. So initially our MR was showing features of more like an meningeal encephalitis okay. and CS7 analysis was showing more like a partially treated bacterial meningitis. Oh, oh, partially treated is written by somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are your differential diagnosis? Somebody is having altered behavior, she is elderly, mm -hmm. she is having urinary tract infection, mononuclear cells. What is your differential diagnosis? It can be One partially treated. Be, uh, then another could be, it could be TB also. It can be TB. We need to follow up the patient. Mm -hmm. then. And viral infection. Viral infection. It is viral. It can be viral and coming up. Okay. Mm. Then, mm. which virus can present with the urinary infection with brain infection? Herpes simplex. Herpes simplex type two. Two. Okay. That can present with urinary tract infection or blebs in the urinary tract mm. with uh, altered behavior, encephalitis. So you don't get any culture positivity, nothing. Then any mm. parasite toxoplasmosis. Or Neurosystem okay. sarcosis, okay. all of these patients okay. can present with altered sensorium plus fever, all of these issues will be Okay. So there will be issues picked up in the MRI, but there was no of this. Okay. But what else? Other than infection, you don't consider anything. Degenerate to that multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis? What is multiple sclerosis? Spatial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spatial. Multiple inflammations in multiple time. That is multiple sclerosis. So it can be, it can be encephalopathy. It can be some focal neurological, whatever it is. But we don't consider multiple sclerosis in somebody having altered behavior like this. Any other encephalopathy other than routine encephalopathy? But what can you talk? Autoimmune encephalopathy. Autoimmune encephalopathy is one important condition we should never miss in an elderly individual like this who can have. All features of uh, encephalopathy, including raised cells, lymphocytic predominance, protein will be raised, culture will be negative. So, autoimmune encephalopathy is one thing we should not forget. They have altered behavior, they have encephalopathy features. Metabolic encephalopathy, hyponatremia, uh, Which metabolic encephalopathy you get? Raised cells? You don't get. In uh, thyroid dysfunction, hypothyroidism, what type of encephalopathy you get? What is the CSF finding? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, raised protein, mm -hmm. no cells. Mm -hmm. So that is also there. That also you should consider if there are cells are negative. Mm -hmm. Here cells are positive, so mm -hmm. we don't consider that type. But it's still auto autoimmune encephalopathy, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, DD. Uh, DD should be kept in mind. But mostly what you told is. It's a partially treated bacterial meningitis, or it can be a viral encephalopathy. Mm -hmm. okay. So actually, we sent the cytology for uh, gram smear, which came to be negative. Uh, then uh, gram smear also negative. Gene spread was negative, and back to this thing, uh, fungal smear was also negative. Okay. And then we and the ophthalmology consultation for any features of papilledema, which also came to be negative. I had both blood and urine cultures were also set up. Okay. And so she con was continued with her antibiotics, but. In view of the meningitis, we change the antibiotic to ceftriaxone. Okay. And following that, along with that, actually, we want since the uh, symptoms are progressive, like 
even though the censoring was slowly coming up, uh, her altered behavior actually became worse and she was very much irritable and all that. So we gave a psychiatric consultation and actually we started him on around IV lorazepam. Mm -hmm. And initially we started around ketapine which was taken to into olanzepin, uh, 5 mg BD. And also in between uh, she was uh, on continuous infusion of fentanyl to control her symptoms. And with this medications by said and our antibiotic treatment, uh, she improved over time. And later we took a repeat MRI and it was showing resolution of the previously reported hyperintensities. Mm. And over a period of about 10 days, actually our sensory slowly started getting better and the inflammatory markers started coming down. And finally, actually now she is again in a much better state, but even though the uh, order so is to do a repeat LP in this patient? Uh, repeat LP was done. Yeah. Repeat LP uh, was done, it was showing a uh, drop in total count, cells count, cells count and run. It was a drop in cell count and it was mainly monomonuclear only predominance. Okay. What was the number of cells? Uh, two. What is the normal CSF cells? Uh, normal zero to two. Zero to five. Mm. Mm. Okay, what is the cell? Yeah. What type of cell? Lymphocyte. Up to five. Mm. That is normal. Mm. Okay. So it has become normal. Mm. Okay. Uh, so so basically, our, uh, with our antibiotic therapy and our psychiatric management, the patient's sensory has improved and the uh, uh, repeat MRI showing the features of an improvement in the invention and capillitis. So finally, in the current state of the patient has significantly improved from uh, like, uh, the state during admission and we can now transport her to a ward for further evaluation. Mm. Uh, so that's the uh, patient. Okay. So basically, if a patient is coming with delirium, we have to think about, we can actually proceed as a uh, five-step process. Uh, first, we have to rule out any primary intracranial disease, which can actually cause an acute altered sensory. Then if that is ruled out, we have to think about systemic conditions, diseases that affect the CNS. And also, we have to think about any exogenous toxin, which can either be drugs or many other uh, toxins. The patient was on lithium. Lithium. And it produced all this. Uh, lithium level was initially slightly uh, increased in the previous outside report. So actually they stopped lithium even before coming to the hospital. Okay. And she was taking olanzapine. Olanzapine. Mm -hmm. And also this could be also due to any drug withdrawal if the patient was on continuous therapy for a long time. If the patient is in high degree fever, mm -hmm. muscle rigidity, arterial behavior mm -hmm. and she is on all these things, uh, what do you suspect? Neuroleptic because of antipsychotic. Anti okay. okay, so Chemical that we have to keep in mind. Okay. And also what was CK? Mm -hmm. CK was done? CK was initially elevated. How much? Around 4000 was the CK. So oh, 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 is it a possibility still? Possibility. It's a possibility. She had a mild fever, altered sensorium mm -hmm. with a high, de high degree CK elevation. Mm -hmm. So that can be even due to olanzapine Olanz induced uh, mm -hmm. uh, neuroleptic management. Okay. Lithium level? Lithium initially was 2.1. It's normal. normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thyroid, power report, huh? Thyroid function test? Thyroid was also initially elevated, uh, so we had to adjust the Elevated means what elevated? Uh, TSH count was... Uh, what is the common side effect of lithium? Tremors. No, thyroid function test. Hypothyroidism can be there. What was the TSH value? 15. 15. 15. Hmm. She was on thyroid uh, hormone, hormone, but it is still 15. Hmm. Okay. What do you do? Suppose you get a patient like this. TSH is 15. She was on thyronum how much? 75. 75. She was on thyronum 70. We don't know whether she is taking properly or not, but TSH is 15. Mm. It means it is high. Mm. How do you know that this patient is in hypothyroid coma? Uh, Exedema coma, what are the clinical features? If you know. That is seen in hypothyroidism. Even if you treat with thyroid hormone, it will not disappear. So that is not a sign of hypothyroid coma. How do you hmm. diagnose hypothyroid coma in a patient who is missing tablets like this? Tell one clinical finding that is enough. She goes with clinical findings. Radicardi. She is having tachycardia. So hmm. we don't consider this as a hypothyroid coma, but hmm. still. The patient is not getting adequate amount of thyroid hormone. And it is a side effect of lithium. She is what she is taking. So 
we had to supplement how do you supplement she was taking 75 how do you supplement the tablet in a sick patient that increase the dose how much how much even if the tsh is normal at least 25% we are to increase mm. here in this patient we have to double the dose because we need rapid correction of uh, thyroid uh, deficiency in this patient okay while you correct suppose it is 75 i want to make it 150 how do you monitor the patient what uh, side effects you anticipate when i am increasing like this sudden arrhythmia okay arrhythmia is yeah. most cardiac failure is most important side effect of sudden increase in the uh, thyroid so, thyroid hormone because already there is high heart rate we are going to increase anyway we have to increase it mm-hmm. so we will be increasing to 100 or 150 so we have to monitor the heart rate sometimes the patient can go to the opposite side mm-hmm. so what how do you manage that that part we have to anyway give it in beta blockers beta blocker we can give propranolol and counter that action mm-hmm. and we have to continue the thyroid hormone we have no other choice mm-hmm. because patient is in altered behavior mm-hmm. so suppose the patient is coming with an outer sensory we have some tools actually we can which we can use to assess the patient and like uh, for initial evaluation ed so the first one is a delirium triad screen yeah. in that the patient is coming with an outer sensory and if is not even responding to our comments uh, he have to think about it's an acute delirium then we can go for a second uh, screening tool which is the brief confusion assessment tool yeah. so but the patient is uh, conscious and obeying comments then we can actually check for inattention mm-hmm. Like we can ask him a question and whether he's if he's giving correct answer or not. If he's responding or giving a proper answer, then we can roll out delirium and continue our other evaluations. Suppose he's again persistently showing inattention or like uh, auto sensory, we can think about delirium. Suppose the patient is in a uh, possibility of delirium, we can go for a specific tool. There is highly specific tool. It is called a uh, brief confusion assessment tool. It is a uh, five uh, four step process. In that first, we will assess for any. altered mental status or fluctuating cause basically the patient is coming with auto sensorium but it, it is highly varying like initially he is restless then he is drowsy like that fluctuating cause is there then we have to think about any inattention so we are asking any question and like if we can ask him to like uh, tell the months in a, from from now to uh, like 3 months backwards mm-hmm. like jan to some point around like that like that simple questions we can ask and if he is uh, saying the thought error or even they are not very simple questions mm-hmm. it's a difficult so, so at least uh, one of uh, at least one other is acceptable more than two others is not acceptable so if the patient is having a altered mental status then we have to say uh, that we can is negative and there is not a delirium and if inattention is positive then again we have to think about delirium we have to go to the next step there is assessment for altered level of consciousness which we can use the richmond agitation this thing sedation scale and If any of this is coming positive, we can state the patient is having delirium, and we can for, go for further evaluation of delirium. So this three-step process is again uh, negative. We have to go for the final step. There is a disorganized thinking. We can again ask for like a few questions which can assess the thinking process of the patient, like simple questions, and if he is not able to ask and um, answer it properly, uh, with more than uh, like less than two hours, he is okay. Anything more than two, again we have to think about delirium. So there is a simple like. Uh, Uh, on ear uh, tools we can use to assess a patient who is having delirium or not and then delirium actually you can uh, the cause can be like uh, from a to z a lot of causes can be there for delirium so we have to rule them step by step so as stated earlier we have to initially go with any intra cranial <coughs> disease first then systemic illnesses which could either be uh, any infection or any toxic or metabolic condition so we have to do a lot in dyslipidemia and infective parameters and also any history of any recent pneumonia uti everything we had to rule out also we have suspected any meningitis and encephalitis in the patient and this patient initially we didn't have any features of any extirpness or anything which we examined and also any features of sepsis we had to rule out then metabolically we have to on the initial level itself we have to uh, rule out hypoglycemia then any our basic electrolyte labs there is any uh, sodium potassium magnesium all we have to rule out and also any uh, like a uh, toxic or drug ingestion history we have to take from the bystander and also suppose the patient is having an acute cardiac failure or any pulmonary uh, embolism also with along with hypoxia and severe arrhythmias again this can trigger an acute de- uh, delirium okay. so we should also we have to consider in a patient so severe arrhythmias alone can even be a cause of auto sensory in the person in patient and again drug related the sensitivity in this patient is she was on lithium 
so which uh, the withdrawal and also overdose can again uh, trigger dementia uh, uh, then again so these are the things actually we have to consider in a patient who is presenting with uh, this kind of complaints. We told about hepatic and renal functions. Ah. Uh, actually, in our uh, evaluation history, was, he was not 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 in all cases of uh, CLD or renal dysfunction. That is ruled out other parts. Ah. And ammonia level everything was check everything was in normal limits only in our lab reports. And then after this, actually, we can course about think about other causes like there are pre-existing causes like degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia already pre-existing, and also any vascular history like any previous CVA. And also any new onset CVA which we have to roll out. Which CVA is going to start at behavior? Uh, temporal. Uh, hmm? Frontal lobe infarct. Frontal lobe infarct. Multi infarct. Multi infarct. Okay, right. it's a chronic disease hmm. which acute uh, stroke can present with uh, altered behavior. Uh, Delirium, I, uh, drowsiness. Thalamus. Thalamus will not produce. Uh, what maintains your arousal? Uh, ascending reticular activation system, posterior circulation circulation can present with altered behavior, but not very common. Hmm. And uh, frontal lobe infarcts, multi-infarcts later. Hmm. So neurologically we have to rule out any multiple infarcts and also any seizures also. Okay. Like non convulsive seizures we have to rule out by How EG. do you rule out? EG. EG. non convulsive hmm. status. Hmm. And also, uh, we have to think about any auto inflammatory conditions and also multiple skin Auto? Auto inflammatory. Auto immune disease. Auto immune disease. What auto immune disease you want to rule out? Uh, At this age? Multiple. Yeah. No. There is no. In a female patient, at this age, what auto immune disease you want to rule out? Vasculitis. Vasculitis can present. But mm. that is not a specific disease. There are a lot of. Mm. Small vessel vasculitis. They can present sometimes CNS vasculitis. Mm. But not routinely we don't see all this. Mm. It can present. Mm. Then again, all patients we have to roll out any neoplasm, any mets or any new onset tumors we can okay. roll out, uh, which we can get in a quimaric with contrast. But uh, a patient who is having uh, breast malignancy or mm. lung malignancy, can, MRI is normal. Can still they have altered behavior? Uh, Paraneoplastic hmm? syndrome. They have autoimmune uh, encephalitis hmm. because of the secondary to, secondary to the lung malignancy or breast malignancy. Hmm. That is very common. Hmm. Then again, we have, to, we have to think about traumatic causes because elderly female there is actually high chance of fall and all, even trivial trauma. Even one month back history, we have to think about which we want to be able to elicit in the patient or the bystanders. Hmm. So initially, we go for a basic screening of a CT brain plane, which we can. Uh, we used to rule out any intracranial bleed. Post COVID. Hmm? Post COVID. Yeah, post -COVID. Mm -hmm. Also, we can think about any uh, vitamin deficiency like vitamin B12 deficiency and uh, thyroid disease and all which can again. B12 deficiency. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Burn the keys and B1. 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 Mm -hmm. B12 deficiency normally they produce uh, peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Severe disease can have dementia. Mm -hmm. Altered behavior is not very common. But thiamine deficiency can present. Mm -hmm. Parkinson plus syndrome. Parkinson plus syndrome. Which Parkinson plus syndrome? Living body damage. Living body damage. Dementia. That is dementia. But they can have mm. this Parkinson. What is Parkinson plus syndrome? As a emergency person, PG, we should not discuss it. What is Parkinson plus syndrome? That is like atypical Parkinson with other involvement. Like if it is multi systemic involvement, you become multi system atrophy. Multi system. That is autonomic, uh, auto, uh, autonomic dysfunction will also be seen in multiple system atrophy. Hmm. Or then you will have Lewy body dementia, wherein patient will have like uh, altered. Parkinson uh, disease is primarily it affects the. Rigidity, hypokinesia, and tremors. It affects the. Um, Substantial Substantial nature. Nature. Parkinson plus is involves multiple including areas. substantial, substantial nature. Nature. it can involve any, any other any part. Other it can involve pyramidal tract, it can involve cerebral, it can involve your eye vision, it can involve the talking progress. Anything that can be possible. In that condition altered behavior can be associated with with dementia. dementia. And more 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 of that drugs produced to be used for Parkinson disease. That is uh, Syndopa. What is that? Middle dopa, carbidopa combination. Carbidopa. That itself can produce altered behavior. Mm -hmm. But this patient does not take all these things. Mm -hmm.
And finally, we had to think about psychiatric causes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which the patient was already having, and uh, the, maybe the drugs may be inadequate, or maybe have a recently changed, can again cause it trigger dementia. So, <coughs> our patients, so basically, we had a multifactorial dementia. One was an infection, infection induced, most probably. Uh, secondly, to UT, and also uh, meningitis was there. And also, the patient was on inadequate drugs for psychiatric, most probably because. Uh, the history of drug, drug tolerance is not very much clear. Mm-hmm. So maybe she may have missed her medications or something, she may again have triggered her current status. So we're treating that all parallelly and now this patient has so much been improved and currently actually I shifted to ward for further management. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.